In the third chapter here of Romans, beginning with verse 10, Paul declares, as it is written, and then he begins to quote scriptures out of the Old Testament, in which God has made his indictment against all mankind. The things that God has said concerning man. That there is none righteous, no, not one. None that truly understands God. None that is really seeking after God. For they've all gone into their own ways. They've become unprofitable. They're none of them that are doing good. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their tongues have used deceit. Poison of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These are all quotations from the Old Testament as Paul is just putting, putting it together to show man what God's evaluation of him is. Now, Paul goes on to say, Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now back at the beginning of the chapter, Paul said, What advantage then doth hath the Jew much and in every way? For really unto him was given the law of God. They had the advantage of having, re having received the oracles of God or the law of God. But with knowledge is always greater responsibility. So having the law of God did not justify them. It was an advantage to know what God required. But it only put a person under greater responsibility. And the law spoke only to those to whom it was given. Now, there is never really any mention of the Gentiles being under the law. Early in the church, there was an endeavor to place the Gentile believers under the law. This came to a head in the church in Antioch when certain brethren had come down from the church that is, was in Jerusalem to spy out the liberty that they had in Christ. And they began to teach the Gentile believers in Antioch then unless you are circumcised and you keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now this, of course, was going contrary to the gospel of grace that Paul had been teaching to the believers in Antioch. But the church in Jerusalem had remained pretty much a Jewish church. The church in Jerusalem had remained in the observance of the Sabbath days and in so many of the aspects of the law. And now they are saying to the Gentiles, except you keep the law and are circumcised, you're not going to be saved. And we remember how Paul returned to Jerusalem for the first church council in order that they might resolve the issue of what responsibility the Gentile believer had to the law of Moses. And after the discussion was held by the church, Peter suggested that they not put on the gent onto the Gentiles a yoke of bondage that neither they nor their fathers were able to bear. James finally suggested that they write to the church and tell them to keep from idols and keep from fornication, and if you do this, you do well. 
But they did not seek to bring the Gentile church under the law of Moses. For whatsoever the things the law said, it said to those that were under the law, it really has very little to say to those who are outside of the law. Now, there are those groups today who are still trying to bring the church under a legal relationship with God. Some of them trying to bring the church or the Gentile church under the law of God. There are those who say that if you worship the Lord on Sunday, that actually you have taken the mark of the beast, for the mark of the beast is Sunday worship. And that Saturday is the only proper day to worship the Lord. And there are other groups that emphasize the law and the importance of the Christian keeping the law of God. Then there are those church, churches that are the holiness type of churches. And they have created, again, the laws or the rules within the church that constitute righteous and unrighteous actions and have sought to direct the activities of the believers by what you can do as a child of God and what you can't do as a child of God. And they have what they call their standards of holiness so that you are encouraged to maintain this standard of holiness. All of these are an endeavor by man to, an eff to effect a righteous standing before God. If I do not do these things, I will be holier than thou who are doing them. If I do these other things, it will make me more righteous. And the whole idea is a righteousness that is predicated upon my actions and my activities. Now any righteousness that I can develop upon my actions and my activities becomes self-righteousness. It is a righteousness that I have created. And if it is a righteousness that I have created by my good actions and my good deeds, then believe me, I'm going to tell you about it. Because I'm proud of what I've done. And I'm going to boast in those things which I have done for the Lord. How many souls I've won to Jesus Christ. How many hours I've prayed. How many chapters of the Bible I've read. How many days I have fasted. And how I would not think of drinking coffee or tea or Cokes or anything to defile my body. Because I have affected a righteousness by rigid standards. I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to live an ascetic life and I'm boasting then of my righteousness. But in the same token, I'm looking down at you as the waitress is serving you a cup of coffee, thinking, hmm, I'm glad I don't drink coffee and pollute my body. So not only am I boasting, but now I am also judging because I have set this standard of righteousness and anybody who doesn't come up to my standards is living below me and I am judging them as living a lower standard of Christian experience or a Christian life. So it leads to 
religious pride, it leads to self-righteousness, and it leads to boasting. Any righteousness that is based upon the keeping of rules. Now, these are characteristics that God doesn't really want me to have. God isn't interested in me having spiritual pride. And surely God isn't interested in me boasting. And he's not interested in my self-righteousness. Therefore, God has rejected any righteousness that man is able to affect by his own effort or his own work. And God has declared that the whole world is guilty. Now, this is perhaps one of the hardest things for us to get freed from. We develop traditions, and traditions have a way of becoming so ingrained and a part of our lives that we'll fight before we'll give up a tradition. We're ready to battle. There are many things that we do traditionally that really don't have any biblical base at all but they've become a part of our church tradition. Somewhere back in church history, they've been introduced and become a part of the church tradition, and thus men will fight for the traditions more than they will a true faith in Jesus Christ. We read of Lent and Ash Wednesday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. And none of these things are in the Scriptures. These are all traditions that have been developed by man, but try and take the bunny rabbit away. <laughs> and you've got a fight on your hands. It's amazing how deeply ingrained the traditions become. And this is one of those things that somehow we have great difficulty becoming free from the idea that I can be righteous by something that I do. Or that I can become more righteous by trying harder. And there's so much Avis Christianity where people are just trying a little harder. <laughs> but the whole effect of it is frustration and defeat in my Christian experience. Because I cannot, try as I may, come up to God's standards. God has indicted the world. God has declared the world is guilty. And God has not intended that the law or the keeping of the law should make anyone righteous. My righteousness has nothing to do with my actions. It is a position that God has accounted to me through my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, my faith in Jesus Christ does alter my actions. But it isn't my actions that make me righteous. It isn't my actions that make me more righteous. I am only righteous because God has accounted me righteous because I have believed in the provisions that He made for me through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
And by my believing and by my faith in Jesus, God has accounted me as righteous. So that I have a righteous standing before God through faith and faith alone. Not through my works. Not through my efforts. Not through my prayers. Not through my devotions. Not through my diligent study of the word. None of these things make me more righteous. Now we have a hard time getting that through our skulls. Paul, in writing to the Galatians, said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should so soon turn away from the truth? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect in your flesh? And yet that is the endeavor that we are so often caught up in, trying to become perfect in our flesh. Through the energy or through the efforts of our flesh, through our dedication, through our commitment, through our asceticism, I'm going to be perfect through my flesh. No, having begun in the Spirit, I must continue in the Spirit. As a Gentile, I never did relate to God through the law. I related to God only through His Son. The law has absolutely nothing to do with my standing before God. So the law spake to those who were under the law, but we Gentiles were never under the law, thus it didn't speak to us. But it spake to those that were under the law in order that every mouth might be stopped. Now Paul in the second chapter in talking to the Jew said, Behold, you're called a Jew. You rest in the law and make your boast of God. The Jew was boasting, but we have the law of God. But we have God's law. You see, you're a pagan or a barbarian because you don't have the law of God. And they were boasting in the law. You make your boast of the law. But in reality, the law really should, if a person properly understands it, shut the mouth of everyone. That every mouth might be stopped. Because if you proper, properly understand the law, the law doesn't justify you, nor does it make you righteous, nor give you a righteous standing before God. What the law actually does is condemn you and make you guilty before God. And so... Those things that the law said, it said to those that were under the law, in order that every mouth might be stopped and that the whole world may become guilty before God. Now, if you understand the law as it was intended when God gave it, the law makes you guilty before God. Now, people have been guilty of misinterpreting the law. They had interpreted the law in such a way that if a man tried hard enough, he could keep it. If you put enough effort in, you'll be able to keep the law. And that's the way they were falsely interpreting the law. They were interpreting the law as dealing with man's outward actions and activities. And that is what Jesus was referring to when he said to the disciples, Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you in no wise are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he illustrated what he was saying by giving them five examples of how 
The scribes and Pharisees have been teaching them the law. And in each instance, they were teaching the law so as that the person, by enough effort, could keep it. But Jesus gave the intent of the law as God meant it when he gave it. You have heard that it hath been said by them of old times. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks upon a woman and lusts after her in her heart has committed adultery. You see, they had interpreted it as only the outward physical act. Jesus said, no, it's an inward thing of the spirit and you are guilty and the Law came to make the whole world guilty before God. And to understand the law correctly, you understand your guilt. They, they were twisting it. They were perverting it. Even as man has twisted and continues to twist the law and misinterpret the law today. You remember Paul the Apostle said, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The latter part here. That's the purpose of the law. To make us know what sin is. Not to make us righteous, but just to let us know what sin is. For, by the deeds or the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, let us say, let us suppose that tonight, through the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts, we would all of us come to a very great consciousness of our sin and our guilt. So much so that we would all begin to weep before God as we saw ourselves in the light of His holiness, and we realized how far short we've come of what God intended man to be. And after this glorious experience of just weeping before God and confessing our sins, we make each of us a very deep resolve and a commitment, God, from now on, I'm going to keep your law. From now on, I'm not going to violate your commandments. From now on, Lord, I'm not going to think an angry thought. I'm not going to think anything of hatred or bitterness or get even. Lord, I'm so sorry for how terrible I've been. And from now on, Lord, I'm going to be absolutely perfect in all of my actions and in all of my thought life. I'm not going to allow one wrong thought to enter into my thinking processes. God, I'm going to be perfect. And let us say that you were able to keep that commitment before God. And we would meet you a year from tonight and we'd say, well, how are you doing? Oh, bless God. God, what a glorious year. I haven't had one wrong, evil thought pass through my mind all year long. I've never thought of getting even with anybody. I've never, I've never felt any bitterness. I've never felt any animosity. I've not felt any striving. Oh, what a glorious life. This is joyful. To live in such harmony with God and the things of God. Well, that's good. I'm proud of you. But that cannot justify you. Living so righteous and pure cannot justify you. By the deeds of the law can no flesh be justified before God. Because you've still got the past. 
to contend with. Let us say that you're guilty of murder. In a fit of rage, you've taken a gun and killed your neighbor. And now you're standing before the judge. And he's ready to pronounce sentence. You've been adjudged guilty. And he says, well, do you have anything to say for yourself? And you say, yes, judge, I've been thinking it over and I know what I did was wrong. And I'm sorry. And I've determined I'm not going to kill anybody else as long as I live. Therefore, I think you ought to let me go out free. Well, with the judges we have today, you'd probably make it on that. (laughs) But that doesn't take care of the past. It doesn't erase the guilt. The word justified means to have a standing before God just as if you had never been guilty. See, justified is more than just being forgiven. So often we say to one another, well, I forgive you. That's all right. God bless you, dear. I forgive you. And we may indeed forgive, but we don't justify. We don't say, well, I justify you. I may forgive, but I can't justify. I can't make that action as though it never did happen. In fact, in my forgiveness, I usually am keeping a record. (laughs) And I'm counting as Peter, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother the same offense? Seven times? And I'm, I'm keeping an account of my forgiveness. Because if you next week do the same thing against me, and I come up to you and I say, I heard that you did that again. Oh yes, I'm sorry, please forgive me. What do you mean forgive you? I forgave you last week. And now you've done it again. You see, I'm keeping a record of my forgivenesses. But to be justified is to have the whole account erased and there's nothing there. You go back and the record is clean. There are no crossed out indictments. And that is what God has done for us in justification. And we'll get into this more next week as we move into this glorious theme now of the Gospel of Romans as we get into that area of justification where God has erased the slate. And you stand before God just as though you had never committed a sin in your entire life. Just as though you had never thought any evil thoughts. For God has totally obliterated the past records. He's destroyed them. He's put them in the paper shredder and then burned them and scattered the dust over the four seas or seven seas. Just as though you had never committed... Now, the law can't do that. The law made us all guilty before God. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in His sight. So no matter 
how righteous you may be from now on. How strictly you may adhere to the law from now on. The law and by the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified in the sight of God. First of all, the law has no power to forgive you of your past transgressions. It only can tell you what God requires. The law has no power to justify a man. The law cannot make you righteous before God, nor can the keeping of it make you more righteous. The power of the law is only to condemn. As Paul concludes, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You say, well, you're really putting down the law. No, I'm not. The law is good. It is holy. It is righteous. It is good. I'm not putting down the law at all. I'm just telling you that God never intended the law to make you righteous. That isn't why God gave the law in order that the people might be righteous by keeping the law. That was never the intent or the purpose of the law. So the law cannot do that which God did not intend it to do. And yet people are trying to use the law for that end. They're trying by the law to make the law do for them what God never intended the law for, to do for anybody. They're trying, to make the, uh, they're trying to use the law to make themselves righteous or forgiven or justified. And the law just can't do that. And yet in our minds we cannot seem to disassociate the law from righteousness and the keeping of the law as righteousness. But the law was given to help us to know what sin is. So, a little further down the line, Paul, in talking about the law, is going to say, is the law sin? No, God forbid. I had not known sin except by the law. I really would not have known what sin was except for the law. I would not have known that to desire your 420 SL was sinful unless the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, to covet or to desire something that belongs to someone else doesn't seem that wrong to me. Just as long as I don't take a gun or a knife and, and go by force and try and take it away from you. Just to look at that beautiful car and say, Ooh, man, I wish I had that car. Now that doesn't seem so awful or so wrong to me. I, I would not have known that that was sin. Except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. And because the law says, Thou shalt not covet, I know that it is wrong that I have this desire to possess something that belongs to someone else. That's sinful. That's wrong. I only know that that is wrong because the law says that it is wrong. You know, uh, there, there's something within me that says, hey, you know, think it, but just don't do it. You know, and as long as you don't do it, you're all right. Boy, I could bash his head in. Ooh. Would I love to hit him? Now, you see, it would seem to me that these kind of thoughts, well, they're probably a healthy, you know, way to get rid of inner hostilities. But the law says no.
You see, I interpret the wrong when I then go ahead and grab a bat and I hit the guy over the head, and I say, oh, that's wrong. I should not have done that. (laughs) But the law says, I should not have thought that. So, I had not known sin except by the law. And by the law came the knowledge of what sin really is. And when the knowledge of sin came, Paul said, I was alive apart from the law once. Then the commandment came and sin revived and I died. I mean, it killed me. When I really understood the truth of God's law, he said, the problem is, is the law is spiritual. The law was intended to govern man's spirit, to deal with the attitude and the spirit of man. And I'm carnal. And that's where the problem arose. So the law revealed to me what sin was, and that is what God intended that the law do, to let you know what sin really is. That's the purpose of the law. Now, the purpose of the law isn't to make you righteous. It's not, now you keep this and be good and be sweet and be kind and, and don't covet, you know, your neighbor's Porsche and, and everything's going to be all right. No, by keeping the law, it doesn't make you righteous. The law serves one purpose and that's to make you guilty. To make you know what sin is. To give you the knowledge of sin so that you can see how that you have come short of what God required. Now, having then a true understanding of the law that it is spiritual and I am carnal and that I am guilty before God because I have desired that which the law said I should not. I have coveted. I have hated. I have had bitterness. Therefore, the law has condemned me and I am guilty before God. Now, the moment I feel this, I'm guilty, I have sinned, then the law has done its job. That's all the law can do. It's now successful. It's done what God intended it to do. It showed me my sinfulness, my guilt. Now, at this point, I am prone to take over. And to say, God, I see what I have done. And I'm ashamed, God, of what I have done. And I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to start keeping your law. I'm going to start being a righteous boy. I'm going to start living the right kind of a life. I'm going to start doing good to others. I'm going to start loving more. And, and I start then in my own efforts to somehow keep the law in order that I won't be guilty before God. But that's my mistake. That's not where I should turn. That's not what I should do. And that will not make me righteous. That will not justify me. Once I have come to the consciousness of my sinful state through the law, then is when I need to turn in helplessness to Jesus Christ and find the provision that God has made for me through Jesus Christ for my righteous standing. Now, God has made provision for my sin in Jesus Christ, but more than that, He's made them the provision for my righteous standing before Him 
in and through Jesus Christ. Not through saying, all right, now Chuck, you've broken the rules, you're guilty, and now, you know, repent. Okay, Lord, I repent. And now keep the rules and be righteous. Well, I may try, but I'm still going to find myself coming short. And God really doesn't say that. God says, now believe. And trust and commit your ways to Him. And Christ comes into my life and He washes me and cleanses me from my unrighteousness. From my guilt. And then, as I believe and trust in Him, He continues daily this process of washing and cleansing me. So that there is really now no condemnation because I'm in Christ Jesus. And my righteousness is something that God has just put down on my account. Because of my faith in Jesus Christ. God accounts me righteous. And do you know the righteousness that he accounts to me? He accounts to me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now that is why it is so foolish for me to try and improve on it. Well, Lord, I'm going to try harder this next week. I know I've blown it this week, Lord. Blew it again. Oh, God, another bad week. Another bad day. God blew it again. But I'm going to try harder, Lord. I'm going to be better tomorrow. I promise, Lord. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. And we go on and on day after day. (laughs) Now, notice. In reality, I want God to accept what I'm promising that I'm going to be as righteous. Not really what I am, because I know I'm not. But it's my promises I want God to listen to. God, I promise I'm going to do better. God, I promise you I'm going to be more faithful in the reading of the Word. I promise, God, I'm going to be more faithful in my prayer. I promise, God. Now, take my promises, Lord, and use those. (laughs) Account me righteous because of what I am promising you I'm going to be doing. But how many times have I promised God those things? How many times have I promised God I wasn't going to do it anymore, and yet I did? How many times I promised God I was going to be more faithful in my devotions, and I wasn't? And so I want God to take my broken promises and account them. Because, Lord, I am going to be better. Now, as you really begin to come into that grace of God, towards us through Jesus Christ. Number one, you'll realize that promises aren't necessary anymore. And to make a vow to God is really only declaring to God that you're going to improve your fleshly performance this week. I'm going to make my flesh come into line, Lord. I'm going to improve the performance of my old flesh life. And it's actually then to trust in the flesh to think that I can do better. And I'm putting my confidence in my flesh, but not in the Lord and in His Spirit. The law 
has made me guilty before God. The law has revealed to me what sin really is. What the righteous standard is that God actually requires of man. And thus, being guilty and being unable to do anything about it, the law has driven me to Jesus Christ. He's my only hope. If I am ever to have any kind of righteous standing before God, my only hope is Jesus Christ. I can never in my flesh please God. I can't bring my flesh around to God's standards. The law is good, it's holy, but it's spiritual. And I am carnal. And thus the law in condemning me, in making me realize my sin, has done all that God intended the law to do. It's driven me to desperation and a hopeless state in my own flesh and to reach out for something more for Jesus Christ. It's been a schoolmaster. It drove me to Jesus Christ. Now in doing that, the law is through. It's done. It's accomplished God's purpose and God's plan. I'm now standing at the feet of Jesus saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, wash me and cleanse me from my sin. Lord, come into my life and infuse me with your power and with your righteousness, Lord. And as I come to Jesus Christ, And I open my heart and life to him. And he begins to take over. He begins to indwell me. He begins to empower me. Now I start to live after the Spirit. And after the things of the Spirit. You say, oh, you mean you don't get angry anymore? No, I don't mean that at all. I don't have to get angry anymore. If I just yield to him, he could give me victory there, but I sort of like getting in the flesh every once in a while. (laughs) My flesh likes me too. He's there to help me. He's there to warn me. He's there to say, hey, just back off. Take it easy. It doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. (laughs) He's there to warn me. He's there to help me. My problem is I don't always heed the warnings. I don't always take the help. It's not that it isn't there. It's not that it isn't offered. But he is so kind. He is so long-suffering. He's so gracious with me that even when I do, and then I make a mess of it, and I get everybody all upset, and then, then I look and I say, Ah, look what I've done now. What a mess. God, won't I ever learn? I didn't. Well, I did want to spout off, but I really shouldn't have, Lord. I know I shouldn't have been. Now look what I've done, Lord. Oh, God, help me. And he's so patient. You know, he just says, well. (laughs) Hang in there. But... Don't try to make the law do what God did not intend it to do. That's the main thing. Don't try by the law to be righteous before God. Just let the law reveal your sin, bring to you the consciousness, the acknowledgement, and drive you to Jesus Christ. 
and then begin there. We'll be getting into next week that righteousness of God, this righteous standing that we have before God that is apart from the law, without the law. The glorious justification and the redemption that we have through Christ Jesus. Oh, these next few verses are the pivotal key of the book of Romans. As we now have have come to the acknowledgement, I'm guilty, the whole world is guilty, there's none righteous, no, not one. The whole world needs help. And now we come to God's help, God's provision for the unrighteous world. Father, we thank you tonight for the grace of God that has been bestowed upon us without measure. (laughs) Lord, you've been so good. Lord, we acknowledge our sin before you. The law has done a good job on us. It's made us realize, Lord, that we've come short, so far short. And Lord, we stand at the feet of Jesus, imploring his mercy, his grace. Lord, we want that you should impart to us his righteousness, that we might stand before you in Christ, holy, righteous, pure, because of the grace that we've received by him. Lord, help us now. It's so difficult for our minds to divorce the issue of the law and righteousness. It seems to be woven within the very... uh, Fibers of our being, Lord. And yet, God, we realize how miserably we've failed every time we've endeavored in our flesh to do any better. Every time we've tried to keep a standard, Lord, we've fallen short and failed. So, Lord, may we just learn to accept thy grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be with you and may the Lord keep his hand upon your life, strengthen you day by day, just fill you with his love and with his spirit and through the working of his spirit may you become all that he wants you to be. In Jesus' name.